Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. The Biden administration today offered up a new price tag on its infrastructure plan as they try to appease Republicans. They dropped the price to under $2 trillion, shaving funding away from broadband and highways instead of environmental projects. Students, parents and organizers rally at Rutgers University. They call for an end to the university's COVID vaccine mandate. A group of Georgia voters are now able to review absentee ballots in Fulton County. They are expected to be at the ballot storage location next week to review them in person. Apple and Epic Games, the creator of the popular video game Fortnite, are in the midst of a three-week antitrust lawsuit. Today, Apple CEO Tim Cook testifies. A young Chinese dissident is being detained in Dubai and could be sent back to China. That's after he got into trouble with the regime for his social media posts. Negotiations drag on for Biden's infrastructure plan. Today, the White House proposed a smaller plan to try to find a middle ground with Republicans. The new plan would cost $1.7 trillion instead of the original $2.3 trillion. They lowered the price tag by taking funding away from broadband, roads and bridges, not environmental projects. The proposal also agreed to reduce the funding request for broadband to match the Republican offer and to reduce the proposed investment in roads, bridges and major projects to come closer to the number proposed by the senators. The proposal is meant to make it clear that they think the Republican offer neglects funding for key priorities like clean energy investments. But the lowered plan still includes tax hikes, which Republicans say they won't support at all. Lead Republican negotiator Senator Shelley Capito met with cabinet members on infrastructure earlier this week. But he says they didn't make such prog much progress since they still can't agree on which projects are classified as infrastructure. And it looks like Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer is laying the groundwork to pass an infrastructure plan without Republican votes. According to Hill sources, Schumer and Senator Bernie Sanders met with Senate parliamentarian again on Thursday. Part of their discussion was about how to use budget reconciliation to pass the bill with a simple majority. The Senate parliamentarian already said reconciliation can be used again this year, but Democrats have held off so far on jamming through another large spending package. And President Biden is planning to double the IRS as part of his efforts to unearth tax evasion. The IRS commissioner says uncollected taxes could total up to $1 trillion each year. Biden is also proposing to raise tax rates, and several top officials could be hit if that bill becomes law. The Biden administration said Thursday it plans to increase IRS employees by 87,000 workers over the next decade, doubling the size of the agency. The Treasury's tax plan includes increasing funding for the agency by $80 billion. The Biden administration is making efforts to go after uncollected taxes. The IRS said it amounted to about $554 billion in 2019. IRS Commissioner Chuck Reddick said recently the figure could be as high as $1 trillion per year. It mainly comes from people underreporting incomes or taking too many deductions. The administration is aiming at generating $700 billion over a decade. Biden is also pushing capital gains tax proposals. Those tax increases will pay for Biden's spending plans. If it becomes law, his several top officials will be taxed up to 43.4 percent. That's an increase of nearly 20 percent. Before taking on his government job, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin unloaded his shares of Tenet Healthcare Corporation, valued between $1 to $5 million. Secretary of State Antony Blinken sold shares valued at over $1 million. While the new move targets high earners, the administration says audit rates for those making less than $400,000 would remain the same. Lin Lin, NTD News. South Korea's president met with President Biden at the White House, where the two honored an American war hero for his service during the Korean War. NTD's Steve Lance brings us more from Washington, D.C. South Korean President Moon Jae-in visited the White House today. He joined President Biden at a Medal of Honor ceremony for 94-year-old Korean War veteran Colonel Ralph Puckett Jr. Because today we are hosting a true American hero and awarding an honor that is long overdue. 
President Moon is the first ever foreign leader to attend a Medal of Honor ceremony, and he said that he was honored to have had the opportunity. South Korean President Moon Jae-in is the second world leader President Biden has met with face-to-face -face since taking office. The U.S.'s relationship with South Korea is very important as you have the geopolitical implications with the U.S.'s greatest threat, the Chinese Communist Party, as well as tensions with North Korea. Earlier in the day, President Moon met with Vice President Harris. They highlighted the importance of the U.S.-South Korea alliance. Globally, our alliance is critical to peace, security and prosperity in Northeast Asia, the Indo-Pacific and around the world. This will most likely be the last time President Moon will visit the United States in an official capacity as leader of South Korea, since his term will be ending within the year. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Steve Lance, NTD News. Biden held a press conference earlier confirming that the U.S. will be providing vaccines to Korean servicemen. The two countries will work together on semiconductors, civil space exploration 6G, and green energy. They will also jointly advance into nuclear power plant markets overseas. And voters in Fulton County, Georgia, will be able to review absentee ballots from the 2020 election. A local judge has just ruled to unseal the ballots. NTD's Allison Lee has the details. Georgia's Henry County Superior Court Judge Brian Amaro ruled on Friday to unseal absentee ballots from the 2020 presidential election in Fulton County. This after local voters filed a petition last year asking for a forensic inspection of the mail-in ballots. They allege abnormalities in the vote count. The petitioners will go to Fulton County's ballot storage facility on May 28th. County workers will be scanning and inspecting the ballots while the petitioners and their experts observe. But Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Braffensberger is against the decision to unseal the ballots. He previously requested the court in April to permit petitioners to inspect ballot images only and deny petitioners' request to inspect and scan ballots. Raffensberger said doing so would violate state law. The same judge granted the petitioners access to scanned images of the ballots in March, but the petitioners said the resolution was too low and asked to see the physical ballots. The petitioners forensics expert David Sawyer said he found a discrepancy between the number of batches received from the Dominion voting system software and the number of secretary of state listed in an audit. The Georgia judge will soon decide on protocols governing the inspection process. Allison Lee, NTD News. Soon, licensed gun owners in South Carolina will be able to carry their guns out in the open when they're in public. The state's governor signed an open carry bill into law this week. NTD's Kevin Hogan has the details. South Carolina Governor Henry McMaster signed an open carry gun law on Monday. He says the new law enhances South Carolinans' ability to exercise their Second Amendment rights. Starting August 15th, the state will be a Second Amendment sanctuary, and the $50 fee for a concealed weapon permit will vanish. Gun sanctuaries are where unconstitutional gun laws would not be enforced. In recent years, they have been a means for states and gun rights activists to ignore federal restrictions on guns. As of 2020, over 400 municipalities in over 20 states passed resolutions ignoring state and federal restrictions on guns. What's more, Texas is pushing to become a Second Amendment sanctuary. Under South Carolina's new law, concealable weapons defined as guns shorter than 12 inches can be carried in plain sight once gun owners have completed training and a background check. And the law still lets businesses prohibit open or concealed firearms, and it allows for temporary restrictions like for festivals, etc. Biden's administration has proposed plans to restrict gun access, including banning certain semi-automatic rifles and revoking immunity from gun manufacturers. That's on the backdrop of 194 mass shootings this year, including four especially deadly shootings, two in Colorado, one in Indiana, and one in Atlanta. Proponents of the law argue that it will not turn South Carolina into some Wild West, and gun rights proponents more broadly assert guns help law-abiding citizens resist tyrannical governments and defend themselves from criminals and lawbreakers. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. Former President Trump is coming back with rallies. He told One American News that they'll happen relatively soon. Trump plans to make an announcement over the next week or two. Trump said he'll hold rallies in Florida, Ohio, Georgia, and North Carolina. 
Trump rallies have historically attracted large crowds, sometimes numbering in the tens of thousands. Trump has been giving several interviews and releasing statements in recent months. His next appearance may be in early June. It'll be his first rally since he left office on January 20th. He's slated to speak at the North Carolina Republican Party's 2021 state convention on June 5th. And it's day 15 since the start of the trial of Epic Games versus Apple. The video game company alleges that Apple's App Store has turned into a monopoly and is taking advantage of developers. The CEO of Apple defended the company on Friday. We hear more from NTD's David Lamb. Apple has denied Epic Games' antitrust claims that it is a monopoly. Its CEO, Tim Cook, testifies in court in Oakland, California. He claims that Apple's mobile products only have a 30% market share in the U.S. and 15% worldwide. But venture capitalist George Haber tells NTD this is more complicated than just one monopoly. This is really a battle between two huge egos of companies that have monopolistic position. It's a very complicated case because you're putting the right of a distributor, in this case Apple, to charge a percentage of the revenue for the product that they distribute. These cuts can range from 15 to 30 percent. From Epic's perspective, the fight is about, okay, I'm paying you a percentage of the original game, but everything I sell inside the game should not be charged. Haber says investors will not be impacted by the lawsuit. Percentage cuts are common as Amazon and Google do the same thing. Apple says that Epic Games breached its developer agreements by introducing a direct pay option. Every corporation that is a public company has their shareholder best interest or their CEO would be flown out of the window. So the customers are not the shareholders. Now, indirectly, does Apple want their customers to have the best and most pleasant experience? Yes, because then the customer will come back. Their real interest, as any other company, is in maximizing profit while maintaining some kind of a decency within the bounds of the law. Other than going through the App Store, getting software on Apple products is difficult. During the trial, the judge asked Cook for his understanding of the term sticking. Cook responded that the term has circulated within the company, and it's having such high customer satisfaction that people don't want to leave. The dispute began last August when Apple removed Epic's game Fortnite from the App Store after Epic announced a discount for the popular game's digital items in a direct purchase plan. David Lamb, NTD News. Rutgers University says they want to keep their students safe free from COVID. So they have a new rule. Get a shot or stay home. NTD's Miguel Moreno has more from students who have a problem with being turned away for turning down a vaccine. So a lot of universities in the U.S. are requiring that their students get vaccinated against COVID if they want to attend this year. Rutgers was the first to do it. And we're here right in front of the school. But behind me, you'll see parents, organizers and students protesting that requirement. They showed up in the hundreds. In a nutshell, everyone told us they want students to have a choice of hitting the books without getting the shot. So Rutgers says they're doing this because they want to keep students safe. And as we all know, you can spread the virus. So why not comply with their policy if their mission or their aim is to keep people safe? Yes, I mean, we totally understand it's people, uh, their aim to you know, keep the Rutgers community safe. Uh, but at the end of the day, what we put into our bodies and what vaccines we take, what medicines we take, that's your own personal choice. Nobody can force you to do that. The government sure can't do that, so a public university can't do that. Because I love Rutgers as a university, but I'm not going to be able to attend if I don't want to get the vaccine and they're mandating it for me, unfortunately. New Jersey schools can legally require their students to get vaccinated, and students can apply for religious or medical exemptions. But these protesters raised another issue. The three available COVID vaccines are experimental, not yet fully approved by the FDA. 
The pharmaceutical manufacturers have zero liability. So if you are now forcing your student population to take an experimental vaccine to continue their education, are you as the university assuming liability for any death or injury that results in that? We asked Rutgers if they would consider changing their policy, but they doubled down, saying the university's position on vaccines is consistent with the legal authority supporting this policy. We later learned that Rutgers isn't requiring their staff, like professors, to get vaccinated for COVID, only their students. They didn't deny the claim when we asked. Instead, they said they strongly urge staff to get vaccinated ASAP and that their students are more likely to get infected. It's terribly unfair. Republican Assemblyman Jerry Scharfenberger says he's against the university's policy. But would you want teachers to get it if students had to get it in the end? I want faculty to get it if they so choose. If nothing changes, unvaccinated Rutgers students can take online courses after the policy goes into effect this fall semester. Miguel Moreno, NTD News. Senator Mitt Romney is urging the Biden administration to step up vaccine aid to countries in need around the world. He says the CCP is using its own inferior vaccine to further its global political goals. Senator Mitt Romney urged the Biden administration on Thursday to provide more vaccines to countries in need. He added this is to counter China using its own vaccine to force other countries to follow the Communist Party's political goals. Earlier this week, the Financial Times reported Honduras may be forced to switch diplomatic ties from Taipei to Beijing to gain access to Chinese vaccines. Honduras is one of Taiwan's few remaining allies. Beijing now seeks to use access to Chinese vaccines as levers to extract favors from Latin American and Caribbean governments despite questions about the vaccine's effectiveness. China has used vaccine access to induce Brazil and the Dominican Republic to reverse prior commitments to exclude Huawei from its 5G networks. So far, Biden has promised to donate 80 million doses of virus vaccines without naming the recipient countries. But he promised that the U.S. would not expect any favors in return. The U.S. Senate and House lawmakers reintroduced a bill that would deny visas to foreign spies, particularly those with ties to the Chinese Communist Party. Three congressional Republicans reintroduced a bill called the Protecting America from Spies Act that would allow the State Department to deny visas to those engaged in espionage or other activities against the United States. This Senate bill was introduced by Senators Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. The House version was introduced by Congresswoman Vicki Hartzler. Rubio said in a statement on Thursday, We know that the Chinese Communist Party will spare no effort to steal from and exploit American companies and universities. And he says, This legislation prevents repeat offenders from gaining access to our country. We should require federal contractors to disclose any commercial ties they might have to the Communist Party of China. A Washington-based think tank compiled a list of 152 publicly reported cases of Chinese-linked espionage. The data shows that military and commercial technologies are the most common targets for theft. Of the 180 misconduct investigations at the National Institutes of Health, more than 90 percent of the cases have links to China. Washington, D.C. is starting to look more like the famous tourist hub it was before the CCP virus. Mayor Muriel Bowser lifted nearly all restrictions today, and people tell NTD they think it's about time. NTD's Melina Weiskup has more from D.C. More feet on the streets and less masks on faces, two signs that the nation's capital is getting back to normal. And for some, it's a brand new journey. So we've never parented outside of a pandemic, and we haven't done much with her, so we're still figuring all that out. Starting Friday, nearly everywhere, from recreation facilities to offices, can start welcoming customers again at full capacity. I guess I'm 50-50 on it. Um, I think in a way it is a good idea, but you can't rely on all the people doing the right thing. Uh, it's about time. Follow the science. It should be open based on what we understand, and glad it finally is getting to that point. Most tourists we spoke to said that they were happy and it's about time that the restrictions are lifted here in D.C. and across the nation. Some of the people said that they do feel more comfortable not wearing a mask outside, but prefer to have one on when they're indoors. But others say that they're pretty fearless and they're glad that everything's getting back to normal. Back up now. I think it's great. I think it's about time to everything to start opening up again. You know, everybody's getting vaccinated. It's time to go ahead and start opening things up. 
kids going back to school, masks coming off, I think it's the right time. Under the eased restrictions, restaurants open at full capacity too. But one owner tells us that the new work from home trend will continue to impact restaurants who profit from business travel. It may never get back to where it was because I think people are finding that they can, they can work online. But I think it will come back somewhat. So I'm anticipating that we will finish this year at maybe 60, 65 percent of pre-COVID sales. He says he had to let go around 80 percent of his workers at some points just to stay afloat during the pandemic. And while they're trying to bring those workers back now, he says unemployment benefits are interfering with that effort a bit. You know, the, the minimum wage in D.C. is $15 an hour, which is the highest in the country. But, uh, you know, if you can get $25 an hour between the government and local unemployment, why would you why would you come back to work? Bars, nightclubs and large venues are still restricted to operating at 50 percent capacity for now. But those final restrictions are set to ease on June 11th. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weisscup, NTD News. An animal park in Oklahoma that was featured in the Netflix series Tiger King is under fire. Federal agents seized their protected big cats under an authorized search warrant. NTD's Christina Kim brings us the details. Federal agents seized a total of 68 tigers, lions, lion-tiger hybrids, and one jaguar from Jeffrey and Lauren Lowe's Tiger King Park in Oklahoma. The couple in this park are best known for their appearance in the series Tiger King, and they're being accused of mistreating their cats. The Department of Justice conducted three inspections since mid-December last year, and the Lowe's received citations for failing to provide the animals with adequate or timely veterinary care, appropriate nutrition, and shelter that is big enough or protects them from inclement weather. During a hearing last week, a judge found the zoo owners to be in contempt for not complying with court orders to employ a qualified veterinarian for the animals. An attorney for the couple told a federal judge that the Lowe's want out completely. Acting Assistant Attorney General Nicholas McQuaid said that the DOJ is working to ensure the animals are sent to responsible animal preserves where they can be safely maintained rather than exploited. The DOJ says this seizure should send a clear message that they take alleged harm to captive bred animals protected under the Endangered Species Act very seriously. Christina Kim, NTD News. Coming up, New York's Attorney General wants to hold police officers more accountable when using deadly force. She announced a new bill that tackles the use of lethal force. New York's Attorney General announces a police reform bill that will hold officers more accountable when using deadly force. She says New York laws have made it extremely difficult to prosecute officers who have used excessive force. NTD's Jason Perry has the details. New York State Attorney General Letitia James wants to hold police to a higher standard when using lethal force. She talked about her Police Accountability Act here in her office in downtown Manhattan. She wants deadly force to be used as a last resort, only when a threat is truly imminent. And guidelines for escalation of force are currently in the police patrol guides, but are not law. Under our current law, an officer who suspects an individual attempted to commit the crime of arson, even if that attempted act occurred two weeks prior, that officer could be justified in using legal force to arrest that person or prevent, or prevent his or her escape. She claims the bill will not affect those split-second life-or-death situations that officers face. Particularly when confronted with a dangerous situation or when their life or the life of another individual is being threatened, it will not change those situations. There are reasonable protections that officers need, need in situations like those. Eric Garner's mother, Gwen Carr, attended the event. A New York City officer placed a chokehold on Garner while arresting him for selling loose cigarettes, leading to his death in 2014. It represents the first major step in this nation to bring about change. So far, the bill has only been introduced, and it still needs to go through all the legal steps before it becomes law. Jason Perry, NTD News, New York. 
Green space is essential in any city, and in New York City, officials are planning a new waterfront park that will not only bring a little nature into the city, but also double as a flood barrier. Lower Manhattan is getting a facelift. That is, crews are actually lifting East River Park by 8 to 10 feet. Janie Bavishi is the director of the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency. Um, this is a project that is going to protect 110,000 people on the Lower East Side of Manhattan, 28,000 of whom live in public housing. This is a community that was really devastated by Hurricane Sandy. Uh, the floodwaters came over the coastal edge and, and really went quite far into the neighborhood. In 2012, Superstorm Sandy destroyed or damaged hundreds of thousands of homes and businesses in coastal New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut. Officials in Manhattan have found a way to offer 2.4 miles of greater protection downtown and leisurely breathing space for millions of residents. New York City's Design and Construction Commissioner, Jamie Torres Springer. The idea of just building a flood wall uh, and just leaving it sitting there in place just didn't work. So instead, what we're able to do for most of the project extent is we're able to really put the flood wall underground and then raise the new park that we're going to reconstruct on top of it. Uh, you won't know the flood wall's there, but we'll get an entirely new park with all of the benefits of that. That's the general design approach. With 520 miles of coastline in New York City, protecting it from storm surge is a monumental task. The entire project of $1.45 billion is set to be completed in 2025. Coming up, police are leaving Seattle after a series of laws were passed that restrict police authority. The president of the Seattle Police Union talks about what it means for the city. And California's cherry season sends crowds of local to local farms to pick their own cherries. It remains popular even as lockdown eases, and some have decided to make it a family tradition. More on that here on NTD News. There's cultures that have been lost, but this culture hasn't been. The artist is showing us our sense of who we are, where we came from. You look at his hat. His hat is knitted probably by a man because a man traditionally knitted the hats. That hat tells you the story of who this person is, what his place in the culture is, the animals around him. Everything's all contained in the messages in the hat. And the tool that he's carrying over his shoulder. This is a centuries old tool that has been able to rework the mountains. Those traditions are invaluable and if we don't honor those traditions then we're rootless. The artist is showing us the value of maintaining our culture and respecting our culture. One West Coast state recently passed new laws restricting police authority. As a result, police are moving to other jurisdictions. A police union leader talked to NTD about why this is happening and about the implications for safety. Police are leaving Seattle in droves. By the end of May, there could be as many as 300 police gone from the force. That's according to the president of the Seattle Police Officers Guild, Mike Solon. We're a third 
officers down in the size of the department, a third. You can't recover from that. It'll take decades. I predicted we could possibly lose four to 500 people. Hopefully that's not the case. I don't want to see that. In fact, I want to recruit more people. I'm losing members here. On May 18th, Washington State Governor Jay Inslee signed 12 bills into law limiting police authority. Washington police are now banned from using chokeholds and no-knock entries. Before last year, Seattle's police department had previously spent 10 years reforming their tactics. Mayor of the city of Seattle, the president of the city council, rolled out a public relations campaign applauding this agency as being the model reformed agency. And I'm fearful that due to this hyper-focus, hyper-scrutiny on the profession of law enforcement, how can jurisdictions recruit quality human beings to do this difficult job? None of those bills really address how this will impact crime. Anti-police protests have continued for a year since George Floyd's death. Solon tells NTD that politicians are appealing to the loudest group. Stop inserting politics into public safety. As you know, several of these council members, the current ones, ran on a platform in 2019 to get elected on pro-police, pro-public safety platforms. And what's stunning is that our politicians are still listening to the activist crowd, that small group, yet loud group, that control politics in this city, that small activist crowd is dictating everybody's public safety. He says there's only one result to expect with fewer police in town. Picture a more lawless Seattle where people's public safety interests will be impacted in a negative way. And I've mentioned before, and this is an alarmist talk, it's reality. Crime will visit people's doorstep. It's just a matter of time when that really starts to impact the majority of the citizens, and I hope it doesn't. Despite the Washington state government's new laws, Solon says a majority of Seattle residents still support local police. It's cherry season in California. Some farms are letting locals have their own cherry picking experience. NTD's Eileen Eng takes us there. This popular farm in Brentwood draws crowds every year for its annual cherry you pick. Here at None Better Farms, people can pick cherries off trees. They're priced at $3.50 per pound, and people must pay for everything they've picked. It attracts people of all ages. I love eating them, but I also <laughs> love picking them. I love eating them even more. So our first time was last year. We came, um, it was really the beginning of the pandemic, and it was the first thing that we could think of to do that sounded actually fun. The Schreiner family picked five buckets in an hour. They intend to give some to friends and make pies and jams with them. The best ones I liked were I like... I like the darkest ones. The mm -hmm. ones I liked were like the ones up high. Why did you like the ones that are higher? Because like they're darker and they're more juicy. We like the freshness and usually we pick it like when it's in season. For others, it's their first time cherry picking. I feel excited. I guess we'll go and find out what it's like. For over 150 years, this family-owned 75-acre farm has been providing fresh fruits and vegetables to the community. Ready to pick right now are corals, mainly. Uh, the champagne coral cherry. Um, it's a dark red cherry, almost purple, crunchy, really sweet. It's one of my favorites. Howd has been the owner for two years now, after taking over from his grandfather. He suggests picking cherries from the stems so that they will last longer. Howd says the only way to find one's personal preference is to take a bite. No reservations are needed to pick cherries here, and they open seven days a week from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Eileen Ang, NTD News, California. Coming up, a young Chinese dissident is being detained in Dubai while he was traveling to New York. He could be sent back to China and potentially face torture. And the European Union voted to overwhelmingly to freeze ratification of a deal with China. This is after China sanctioned several European officials. That and more in just a moment on NTD News. The United Arab Emirates is planning to extradite a 19-year-old Chinese dissident back to China. The young man is on the Chinese regime's wanted list, and he believes Beijing is behind his arrest in the UAE. Here are the details. The United Arab Emirates, or UAE, is holding 19-year-old Chinese dissident Wang Jingyu captive and planning to send him back to China. The young dissident is on the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP's, wanted list because of his social media posts. 
Dubai police arrested him at the Dubai airport early April. Wang was on his way from Turkey to New York and had a layover in Dubai. Wang's friend tweeted the information and is seeking help from the international community. Wang confirmed to the Epoch Times himself that he is currently detained in a Dubai prison. He told the Epoch Times in an interview on Thursday, this is 100% linked to the Chinese Communist Party. That's the first time he spoke with any media since his detention. They say they will deport this person because he violates national security and so on. They want to send me back to China no matter what, and they come up with all sorts of ridiculous reasons just to get me sent back to China. Wang has been on the CCP's wanted list since February. That's after he questioned Chinese state-owned media's report on the border clash with India. Indian and Chinese soldiers clashed along the border in June last year. India reported 20 deaths. Unconfirmed reports put the Chinese death toll at as high as 45. Eight months later, Beijing officially acknowledged four casualties for the first time. Two days after Beijing finally broke the silence, Wang posted on social media, Why did you announce the death toll so late? What on earth are you hiding? Wang was not in China at the time, but Chinese police still charged him and six other people for, as they called it, defaming heroes and martyrs. They also detained his parents in China. Chinese police even publicized his passport number on Chinese media. Wang said the Chinese regime has frozen all of his parents' Chinese bank accounts and taken away all their foreign currencies without any explanation. Chinese authorities also raided their home. Now the Dubai police are only telling Wang to wait, and the detention center offers him only one meal a day. Workers from the Chinese embassy in the UAE have visited Wang at the detention center. They came to see me and urged me to go back to China. That was basically the case. They promised I would be safe in China and said I can't get out of here anyways. Wang's lawyers later discovered the Chinese embassy there manipulated the case. That's because they want to extradite him to China. His lawyer found out that the Dubai Public Prosecutor's Office wrote off his case last week due to insufficient evidence. But Dubai police refused to let him go and asked him to sign some documents in Arabic. Wang refused because he doesn't understand the language, and local police refused to explain even when he asked. Wang is calling on the international community to pay attention to his case. Because Communist China uses its position as a big country to take advantage of diplomatic exchanges with other countries. The CCP uses its rogue diplomacy to deter these smaller countries and force them to do certain things. Wang says he wants more people to know what's happening to him and to recognize the threat the CCP poses. The European Union says it's going to freeze a major investment deal with China. Lawmakers say Beijing first needs to lift sanctions it has issued on EU politicians. EU lawmakers said they refused to ratify the bloc's investment pact with China. Earlier this year, the EU imposed sanctions on Chinese officials responsible for human rights abuses against the Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang region. Beijing retaliated by sanctioning several European entities and politicians, including five members of the European Parliament. In a resolution adopted on Thursday, EU lawmakers condemned Beijing's sanctions in the strongest possible terms, and they voted with an overwhelming majority to freeze the ratification process of the EU-China Investment Agreement, which was reached last December after seven years of negotiations. Lawmakers said that the suspension will remain as long as the regime's sanctions stay in place. After the vote, one European lawmaker said the China deal is definitely in the freezer. China miscalculated and shot themselves in the foot. Reinhard Boutikofer is one of the MEPs sanctioned by the Chinese regime. Lawmakers also advised the EU Commission that Parliament will consider the human rights situation in China, including in Hong Kong, when deciding whether to endorse the agreement. Coming up in the U.S., sales of wine cans are skyrocketing. But do the French approve of this new take on their favorite drink? And an iconic painting of Copernicus, exhibited for the first time at the National Gallery in London. The exhibit also includes the mathematician's book and an ancient handheld model of the universe. That and more on NTD News. Hi folks, Joe Namath here, and if you're on Medicare, this is important. You're now entitled to eliminate co-pays and get dental care, dentures, eyeglasses, prescription coverage, in-home aids, unlimited transportation, and home-delivered meals, all at no additional cost. 
Plus, your zip code may have coverage with the give back benefit that adds money back to your Social Security check every month. I call to get dental, transportation, meals, and the gift back benefit. With this virus situation, I call to get everything I'm entitled to. I couldn't believe I was missing out on so many benefits. With the uncertainty of the virus, you need to get everything you're entitled to. Millions of people have trusted the Medicare coverage helpline. You can too. Call now. It's free. Call 1-800-764-1930. That's 1-800-764-1930 now. In the UK, new cases of the Indian variant of COVID-19 increased by more than 2,000 in a week. But data shows they're clustered in three Northwest England hotspots. Official figures suggest the Indian variant may not be spreading as quickly as feared. Infection rates are going up in only three out of 15 hotspots in England. Public Health England says the latest weekly data shows 3,424 cases of the Indian variant. That's an increase of over 2,100 on the previous week. Most cases were concentrated in the northwest and London, but Public Health England says it is seeing clusters of cases across the country. Bolton is the worst hit area, with 923 Indian variant cases on the week up to May 15th. That's almost double the previous week. Blackburn with Darwen is the hotspot, with the second highest number of cases at 217, up by 50% on the previous week. Bedford has 220 Indian variant cases, up 83% on the previous week. In areas outside these three hotspots, increases of new infections were clearly well below these levels. For example, London's hotspot is Hounslow, with 153 cases by May 15th, but that's up less than 30% on the week before. NHS Test and Trace says 15,200 people in England tested positive for COVID-19 in the week to May 12. That is 5% more than the previous week and the first seven-day increase since early January. Canned wine sales have skyrocketed over the past decade in the U.S. In France, the first cans made it onto supermarket shelves. But the French have mixed opinions toward the beverage. NTD's David Vives has more from Paris. Before being a glass bottle beverage, wine was drunk for centuries in Anfuras, a two-handled vessel. But the U.S. seems to have set a new standard for wine containers, cans. In less than a decade, the sales of canned wines skyrocketed from $2 million in 2012 to over $183 million in 2020, making it the fastest growing segment of the market. In France, some brands are taking their first step into this untapped market. As in the US, these cans especially target young people. However, it seems these students were not yet ready to enjoy wine in a can. I don't know. When I look at it, mm, this seems like a poor quality wine to me. And they did not lack opinions. Sounds like an abomination. Wine tasting is a part of gastronomy. We have glasses for red wine, white wine, for a bunch of alcohol. So putting it into a can and drinking it as if it was Coca-Cola, this is just atrocious. It's strange, I think. A bottle of wine, you can share it with people. It's a moment you share with your friends. According to one brand of canned wine, the wine is less than two years old, prepared this way to be drunk without aging. But how would an industry expert react? We went to see Alexandre Jean. He worked as a sommelier for 20 years in the most prestigious restaurants of Paris. He'd never heard of canned wines before we met. We asked him to conduct a taste test. A fruit-focused expression, cassis, not much alcohol, nicely balanced. First impression is good. I'm a little bit surprised by the quality and wine expression. Pretty nice, in fact. The test taste continued with the $7 bottle of wine. The bottle is the same year as the can, 2019. Oh, I would never thought to say that verdict. I like the canned wine better. Damn! 
The bottled wine carries a tradition of its own for sure. It's another way to taste the wine. But it all depends on the intention behind the work of the wine producer. You might put a good wine in cans. But whatever the container, the best way to drink wine is to do it with moderation. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. A London exhibition is celebrating a Renaissance-era astronomer. His theories put the sun at the center of the universe. Over 140 years ago, a great Polish artist painted an iconic portrait of the man depicting his conversations with God. This monumental canvas of astronomer Nicholas Copernicus is making a rare visit to Britain's National Gallery in London. This is the first time it has ever been shown in the UK. The most famous Polish painter of the 19th century, Jan Mateko, created this artwork in 1873. It was to mark the 400th anniversary of Copernicus's birth. The painting's name is The Astronomer Copernicus, Conversations with God. This is certainly an imaginary scene. Mateko wanting to commemorate the 400th anniversary of the birth of Copernicus imagines this scene of him on the roof at the cathedral at Frambork turning to discuss uh, with God his discovery. Now it's very important. Copernicus has already made the discovery. The diagram of uh, the sun at the center of our system is already there. But now, in confidence, he turns to God uh, so they can discuss his finding. As a devout Christian, Copernicus believed that God created the laws of motion of matter in the most efficient way. This guided him to formulate the epoch-making heliocentric theory in 1543. He wrote it in his seminal work on the revolutions of celestial spheres. According to the British curator, Copernicus himself never clashed with the Roman Catholic Church. Neither did the Church excommunicate him. Indeed, enlightened clerics of the day celebrated his breakthrough. This painting of a genius at work achieved almost instant fame when it was first exhibited in Poland. The Polish artist was considered a national treasure in his homeland for portraying great episodes of Polish history but his fame has dwindled in Western Europe. The fact that there are no works by him in this country mean that, means that he's not well known here, he's not known at all. And uh, I hope that as a result of this show, it's a name that people will, will reckon with. In addition to the painting, the exhibition also includes Copernicus's book and an astrolabe. That's an ancient handheld model of the universe. French contemporary artist J.R. unveils his latest art installation displayed in front of the Eiffel Tower. It fools the eye and gives the impression that the Paris landmark stands above steep cliffs. Tourists flock to take photos with the piece in silly poses. The optical illusion shows the tower in black and white with its feet standing between the two cliffs. The illusion is viewed perfectly from a certain angle. JR unveiled his latest piece on the day restaurant terraces reopened in France and Parisians were eager to return to a form of normalcy. He's known for huge format street art and has done pieces around the world. In 2019, he took on the Louvre Museum and made it its iconic pyramid disappear through an image illusion. Recently, he created a piece at Florence's Strozzi Palace, showing the illusion of a crack that revealed the structure's interior. And a school in the UK's South Wales is using animals to help students with special needs. Now students there are welcoming two new arrivals as part of Mental Health Awareness Week. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the story. These cute pygmy goats are getting a lot of attention. They're the latest additions to the Headland School in Penarth. Students there help care for the furry friends and say they benefit from having them near. Yeah, I'm like a bad day. Like you could just come and you could express your feelings and you could just come and you can spend time with them. There are even more animals here for the children to bond with, including alpacas, ducks and chickens. Action for Children's Headland School educates children with special needs. Staff say the animals are a real help. Watching um, our young people with such diverse backgrounds coming down so like, so like sitting talking and opening up about so like issues and problems in their lives it's been fantastic and I think this has been an absolutely huge part of it. The pupils take full responsibility for caring for the animals. They build their homes, shop for their food and feed them. Some students report that it's had a positive impact on the rest of their education too. So um, before we had the animals and stuff I was quite not motivated to come to school. I would uh, usually not come in 
on some days. And now, obviously, since having the animals down here, this boosts my motivation to come to school to look after them. Ducks, alpacas, and the new pygmy goats have become invaluable classroom assistants, a boost for children's mental health and education. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox. Have a new channel subscribe to us on YouTube at NTD news get the highlights of our news broadcast and the most important headlines that we curate especially for you don't miss out on important news our videos are being deleted so if you don't want to be cut off from honest news take a moment to sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.ntd.com so you don't lose access to NTD go to newsletter.ntd.com to sign up for our evening newsletter